Hello and welcome to 21st Century. I'm Daljit Daliwal. Weapons of mass destruction, nuclear, biological and chemical, have plagued the human race since their invention and they still pose a threat today. Terror attacks and accidents have spread panic in several countries over recent decades. But there are signs that increased vigilance and cooperation can help create a safer world. March 20th, 1995, morning rush hour in Tokyo. In crowded subways, terrorists release the deadly nerve gas sarin, killing and maiming thousands and injecting fear and panic into the minds of millions. Shizue Takayashi's husband, Kazuma, died while trying to help others. A small plaque at the Kasumigaseki station in Tokyo pays tribute to him and other brave subway employees who lost their lives during the attacks. Across the globe in Goiânia, Brazil, Odisson Alves Ferreira is a victim of another tragedy. Então, esse aqui é o cemitério Parque. Ele, evidentemente, que toda a população de Goiânia está usando, mas esse espaço aqui é especial porque as vítimas do acidente com o 37 estão enterradas nesses túmulos. Odesson and thousands of others had their lives transformed in 1987 when a radioactive source material, cesium-137, was abandoned by a hospital and spread among unsuspecting citizens. The calamitous results would sound the clarion call to authorities in Brazil and hopefully everywhere. Poison gas first appeared during World War I. The Allied forces and the Germans were deadlocked in trench warfare at Ypres in Belgium. For roughly 100 years, countries have possessed and used weapons of mass destruction. During World War I, the Germans, British and French used them against each other starting in 1915. During World War II, the Japanese used biological weapons against the Chinese. A lone B-29. And the United States dropped the world's first atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. In the Iran-Iraq War in the 1980s, Saddam Hussein used chemical weapons in the battlefield and to murder civilians in the Kurdish city of Halabja in 1988. In recent years, terrorists started seeking to obtain and use such weapons and now could inflict suffering on civilians almost whenever and wherever they choose. In the United States, the first bioterror attack came in 1984. Followers of cult leader Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh contaminated salad bars at restaurants in Oregon. Dozens were hospitalized. And in 2001, just weeks after the 9-11 terror attacks in New York, letters containing anthrax were mailed through the U.S. postal system. A positive anthrax culture was found at the remote mail site that serves the White House. Five people died and fear became widespread. It cost taxpayers billions of dollars to manage the consequences. So what can be done to prevent terrorists from acquiring and using weapons of mass destruction and to protect civilians from WMD terror attacks? In recent years, the international community has taken bold actions. The United Nations established treaties to prohibit weapons of mass destruction and to prevent their proliferation. The most forceful measure is United Nations Security Council Resolution 1540, which UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon says is essential to keep people safe. The draft resolution has been adopted unanimously. Weapons of mass destruction are a serious threat to international peace and security. It is particularly important 
that terrorists do not acquire such weapons. Ten years ago, the United Nations Security Council unanimously adopted Resolution 1540. Today, I appeal to all states and other key actors to intensify efforts to implement its key requirements. We cannot afford to be complacent in the face of such a grave threat. Michael Douglas, UN Messenger of Peace, recently delivered a similar message. The issue that I think now has become the most important with all the negotiations that have been going on and here in the United Nations um, is, is this terrorism. But the danger and fear of, of loose nukes, uh, of a small amount of highly enriched uranium or plutonium, or even abilities to make a, a dirty bomb, um, is, is a terrible problem. Resolution 1540 requires every government to adopt and enforce laws to prevent terrorists from acquiring and using weapons of mass destruction. But as United Nations member states today do their best to ensure that Resolution 1540 is implemented, citizens like Shizui Takahashi of Japan and Odesson Alves Ferreira of Brazil are still grappling with the past and fearful of the future. In the subway attacks in Japan, members of the cult group Om Shinri Kyo carried liquid sarin in plastic bags which they had wrapped in newspapers. Once on the trains, they punctured the bags with the sharpened top of their umbrellas and made for getaway cars. で、その Shiro Kamamoto is a counter-terrorism expert based in Tokyo. 1995年の3月20日のサリン事件の前には Thirteen people died from the sarin attacks, over 5,000 were injured. New laws enabled Japan to improve its detection and response capabilities. In 1995, police had to use canaries to detect sarin gas. Today, officers scan containers at ports to detect nuclear and radioactive materials. The country is safer than ever before, say Japanese authorities. But the recent Fukushima earthquake raises new fears. Which is exactly what the United Nations and the international community have been trying to achieve, says Ambassador O Jun permanent representative of the Republic of Korea to the United Nations. He chairs the Security Council Committee, which monitors the implementation of Resolution 1540. Over the past 10 years, we have worked for universal implementation of Resolution 1540. The world today is obviously better able to prevent WMD terrorism. Preventing WMD terror poses one set of challenges. 
accidents caused by natural disasters or man-made pose yet another. But images of these accidents are fading. Cervezo, Italy, 1976, Bhopal, India, 1984, and Chernobyl in the Ukraine, 1986, among others. But in Goiânia, Brazil, there is one tragedy many locals will never forget. Com 32 anos, eu achava que estava no ápice da vida e principalmente de produção. De repente, me vi num corte. É, foi como se tivesse feito uma ruptura do, do cordão umbilical até. Journalist Carlos Magno tracked the story of the scavengers who stole a radioactive medical device from the partially demolished Goiânia medical facility, dismantled it, and were captivated by a deep blue light coming from within the open canister. Nesta rua aqui, logo ali do lado, mo é, morava o dono do ferro velho, que, que é o pivô desse, desse, dessa história toda. The scavengers sold the unit to a nearby junkyard owner, Devayer Alves Ferreira. Essa casa ficou muito contaminada porque o, o Devayer, ele distribuiu vários pedaços da pedrinha de Césio 137 para amigos, para conhecidos, para funcionários dele. One of the first people to see Devayer's glowing stone was his six-year-old daughter, Leiji Das Neves. Colocou no chão do quarto e as crianças pôs a mão e a Lady ingeriu. É um, comeu um ovo cozido com a mão suja. Lourdes das Neves was a young mother when her daughter Lady found herself at the center of the crisis. Todos aqui a Lady. 15 minutos depois ela começou com crise de vômito. Aí foi gomitando, gomitando, aí foi a noite toda eu pelejando com ela e ela ruim. Authorities from the Brazilian Nuclear Energy Commission isolated the areas of greatest risk. Over 100,000 potential victims were funneled into the nearby Olympic Stadium for radiation screening. 6.500 pessoas constataram algum tipo de contaminação ou irradiação. Das 6.500 pessoas, 250 delas estavam contaminadas, com a contaminação maior. E dessas, 122 pessoas foram consideradas em estado mais grave. Leiji and seven others were flown to the Navy Hospital in Rio. A few weeks later, grim news came. Four of those victims, including Leiji, had died. The accident and deaths would create a lingering stigma against Goiânia and its citizens who would suffer isolation and prejudice. At times, they were prohibited from boarding planes and moving to neighboring cities. More than 25 years later, some of that stigma has worn off. Yet Goiânia Minister of Health Halim Antonia Gerade believes that the incident has had a profound impact on Brazilian public policy. O Brasil aprendeu com o um acidente radioativo. A vigilância de fontes radioativas hoje é uma vigilância mais séria, hoje é uma vigilância mais responsável. Mas te afirmo, ninguém está preparado para um acidente desse, em qualquer lugar do mundo. But Brazil and the world are getting much more vigilant. In 2011, the Brazilian government released new rules for safeguarding citizens. The international community has also improved protocols for what to do when radioactive source material is lost or stolen. In December 2013, after a medical device containing the radioactive source Cobalt-60 was stolen in Mexico, authorities immediately informed the International Atomic Energy Agency. Tragedy was averted when the Mexican government found the material. Yet despite some success, authorities acknowledge there is no room for complacency anywhere in the world. E eu tenho sim muito medo do futuro das nossas crianças, dos nossos netos, porque aqui já está praticamente esquecido e abandonado.
あの人間は避けようとするそういう悪い癖がやはり20年の間に地下鉄サリン事件でどんなに悲惨な事態が起きたかということをあの語っていく語り継ぐ人たちが少なくなって今の若い人たち二十歳ぐらいまでの人たちというのは現実のこととして分かっていないと思いますそれがすごく怖いです。Still, the past is motivating a present drive for greater international cooperation across the board. UN High Representative for Disarmament Affairs Angela Kane believes such cooperation must extend even beyond governments. The most effective way to actually implement、uh, Resolution 1540、uh, is to work together. Internationally. That means all of the governments, the member states of the United Nations, it means international civil society, it means even private citizens to basically work in a framework that we all aim to achieve the same end. It's impossible to fully heal the wounds of the past, but forceful UN actions like Resolution 1540 may reduce fear and panic, bringing the world closer. To safety and peaceful cohabitation. <laughs>